My name is John Krieger. I'm the executive director of World Denver. We're a nonprofit membership organization that facilitates international exchange and global engagement in Denver. And one of the ways we do that now is through K through 12 education programs that encourage students to think about global sustainability challenges as they relate to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And this past year, several of our students were focused on deforestation and wildlife protection, which makes this especially uh, an important event for us. And we even have a few of those students joining us tonight. So I thank you so much uh, for being a part of this program. I'm excited uh, to watch and I'm excited to hand it over now to Tracy in Colorado Springs to introduce the Colorado Springs World Affairs Council. Well, thank you, John. And it is indeed exciting to launch uh, Colorado's Earth Day celebrations in this manner, uh, to be part of this illustrious group and to be furthering as World Denver does and Foothills and CAS at CU Boulder, um, the important issues that go towards sustainability and um, understanding internationally across all cultures, how, how important these things are. Colorado Springs World Affairs Council is also um, a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, organization that uh, supports international understanding and hopes to elevate peace through those initiatives. Um, thank you so much. And I'll be also now handing it off to certainly one of our esteemed colleagues at Colorado Foothills World Affairs, okay. Stanley Harsha. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. So on behalf of Colorado Foothills World Affairs Council, uh, which does a similar thing to the other World Affairs Councils, but is the Mountain Foothills community. We have quite a large membership up there. I thank, thank very much World Denver members and also the Colorado Springs World Affairs Council members for joining us, and especially to the University of Colorado Center for Asian Studies um, for hosting and helping to, to arrange this, this program. So with that, I'd like to turn this over uh, to the director of the Center for Asian Studies, Rachel Renado at CU Boulder. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stan. And uh, thanks so much to all of our partners, uh, World Denver and the World Affairs Councils and to Stan <laughs> for, for helping organize this terrific event. Um, I'm Rachel Rinaldo. I'm the director of the Center for Asian Studies. We are a hub for Asia-related research um, at the University of Colorado Boulder and um, hopefully in the broader community as well. Um, so we're really excited um, to be able to, to help present this talk. So our speaker, Dr. Ian Singleton, is Director of Conservation at Pan Eco Foundation and Scientific Director for the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program. He was formerly Senior Orangutan Keeper at Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust and Animal Keeper at Royal Zoological Society of Scotland and Zoological Society of London. He studied at the University of Kent where he got his PhD and also at the University of Southern Sunderland. Dr. Singleton works to confiscate illegal pet orangutans and return them to a life in the wild. And he continues field research and monitoring of the remaining wild Sumatran orangutan population in an effort to protect their habitat. He was bestowed the highly esteemed officer of the most excellent order of the British Empire by Britain's Queen Elizabeth for his notable contributions to environmental conservation. Dr. Singleton considers his 2017 discovery of a new orangutan species, the Pongo tapanuliensis, um, also known as the Tapanuli orangutan, alongside other scientists in North Sumatra to be one of his most memorable accomplishments. And our moderator for the Q&A today will be Daniel Nomenko, a PhD student here at, in the Department of Anthropology at University of Colorado Boulder, um, who has worked with an international research team studying the Bornean orangutans and their forest habitats for the past seven years. His work focuses on the impacts of forest fire smoke emissions on orangutan health and behavior and on environmental drivers of oxidative stress and decelerated aging. 
Um, so I think um, I'd also um, want to thank, although I don't think she's here, our event organizer for the Center for Asian Studies, Liza Williams, who has helped a lot with the logistics of, of putting this Zoom call together. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Dr. Singleton. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's uh, still like six o'clock in the morning for me, but uh, just want to say a huge thanks for the opportunity to talk about our work. It's uh, before COVID, I used to travel a reasonable amount and get to talk about uh, to diverse audiences and things. But for the last two years, I've been stuck here in Indonesia, only recently got out of Medan for the first time. Uh, so it's a really nice opportunity to sort of uh, do this again and get back into my old routines. I'm going to talk about sort of orangutans a little bit <clears throat> generally, their status, uh, some of the problems that they face, some of the things that we're trying to do to, to deal with those problems. Some of, the, some of the successes that we've had. And, and then I was going to close at the end with the, a little uh, description of the Orangutan Haven, which is a very exciting, I think, so project that we're working on right now, quite unique and uh, special. Um, so let's get going, yeah? So I work on a thing called the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program, uh, that logo up there on the top left, which is not a legal entity. It's a program implemented by uh, EIS and Ecosystem Lestari, or the Sustainable Ecosystem Foundation, here based here in Medan, Indonesia, in partnership with the Swiss-based Panico Foundation and the Indonesian Ministry of Environment and Forestry's Directorate General for uh, Wildlife Con and Ecosystems Conservation. So uh, let's move on, yeah? So firstly, uh, let's make sure everybody knows what an orangutan is, right? So. Essentially, when, when I started working with orangutans sort of, I think it's about 30 something years ago now, two subspecies were recognized, one on Sumatra and one on neighboring Borneo. And then uh, about 20 years ago, the, the, the experts in taxonomy decided that they justified species status. So we've had for many years the Bornean orangutan Pongo pygmaeus and the Sumatran orangutan Pongo abeli. Uh, with the Borneo orangutan split into three recognized subspecies, the, the western, the central, and the eastern. And uh, the, the way to tell them apart for me, it's usually very easy most of the time, is that they, let me just uh, remove a few faces here so I can see all my slides. There you go. Um, so the, the Borneo orangutan here on the left, if you look closely, you can see that all the little hairs on their face and the beard is exactly the same color as their body hair. Um, whereas if you look at the Sumatrans on the right, you can see that their facial hair is more white or yellowish, and, and they have these really lush, wide, golden beards. Um, so I always kind of, you know, when I started with orangutans, uh, the Bornean orangutans were always in the news and very few people knew that there were orangutans in Sumatra. So I, I took it on myself to try and promote the Sumatrans. Uh, and I always tell people that the Sumatrans are just really way better looking than the Bornean orangutans. And, and I've been telling, saying this so long now that even the people that work in Borneo tend to agree with me because the Sumatrans are just, they have these stunning golden beards and the Borneans have beards that are not much better than I can do myself. Oh, oh, what's going on there? Why did that, was that not gone forward? Okay. Then about, um, <clears throat> about 20 years ago as well, 22 years ago, we, we did some surveys, myself and a few colleagues. We went to all the sort of large forest patches in northern Sumatra and central Sumatra to see if there were orangutans in them or not. There were a lot of rumors around then still. Uh, about orangutans further to the south. We found most of the forests were empty, but we did find orangutans in this place called uh, the Batang Toro region, around the Batang Toro River in, in the area called Tapanuli. Now, but we didn't really realize at the time that they were any different. We just thought this was an outlier population of uh, the Sumatran orangutan. We set up a research station down there to study them, and we've been working to try and protect those forests for quite a long time. Uh, but then about 12 years ago, a, a team from the uh, University of Zurich and the University in Bogor, along with various other people, decided to do a, a, an Indonesia-wide survey of the genetics of orangutans throughout Borneo and Sumatra. And then during the analysis of that data, they concluded that, that it looked like the, the Tapanuli orangutan was um, sufficiently 
it, it was just as related to the Bornean orangutans as it was to the Sumatran orangutans further north. And looking further into that, it, it was again, it looked easily justifiable for species status. And uh, a paper was published in 2017 describing the new orangutan, the Tapanuli orangutan Pongo tapanuliensis by a, a large number of people. I wouldn't call it my discovery, but it was very much a, a, a team effort with a, a large number of people. And of course, it made the news. This was the first description of a new great ape species for nearly nearly 100 years. It's, uh, it was quite a big issue, especially in the primatology world. Uh, this is just a quick look. <clears throat> you can see on the left where they are. Um, if you look at all the lines here, names here from the Alice River upwards, those are all Sumatran orangutans, and those populations are still connected. There's still genetic flow between them. And then to the far south, you see the, the Batantoro forest where they come to the Tapanuli orangutans. And you also see Lake Toba. Lake Toba is, is the site of the biggest volcanic eruption ever known on planet Earth, even bigger than Yellowstone. And it's actually not surprising that the orangutans would be different to the south because a lot of species have boundaries here. You get different gibbons north of Lake Toba than you do to the south. You get some species that don't exist north of Lake Toba, uh, but do in the south. So it's not surprising that the orangutans are also different. And you can see on the right, this is, I'm no genetic expert myself, but you can see on the right how the Tapanuli orangutan with the red circle clusters out with the Bornean orangutan away from the other orangutans from Sumatra. And what was also interesting as well, if you if you look at the number of mutations in a genome, you can you can estimate how old it is. And it turns out that the Tapanuli orangutans is, is the oldest orangutan population in Indonesia. Uh, so it, it's kind kind of interesting because it's like the last remnants uh, of the original wild orangutan population from which all of those in Aceh in the north of Sumatra and all of those in Borneo are descended, or at least that's the way it looks. So what's the status of orangutans in Sumatra? Well, the Sumatran orangutan, Pongo abeli, uh, is 90% of them are in the Loza ecosystem. Uh, Stanley mentioned the, the Gunung Loza National Park, which is an area within the Loza ecosystem. Many of the orangutans, actually the majority of orangutans remaining, are outside of the national park in the lowlands, uh, but still in the Loza ecosystem. So this purple line here denotes uh, the Losa ecosystem uh, in North, Northern Sumatra. Um, there's around 13,500 remaining. We did uh, surveys throughout the habitat uh, back in 2009, 2012, and that was the conclusion. They're listed as a critically endangered species. And they're also mostly in Aceh province, which in the years ago, no, nobody had heard of, but everybody should have heard of from the 2004 tsunami. Now, people say 13,500, Ian, that's loads. Why are you worried about them? Well, I always remind them that Barcelona's football stadium seats 99,000 people. So the, the, all the Sumatran orangutans in the world would sit quite easily in the seats just behind one gold at one, one, end, one end of the stadium. Uh, so the next time you see, uh, this is Lionel Messi, actually, I need to change the slide. But the next time you see somebody taking a penalty for Barcelona, just remember that that's all of the Sumatran orangutans in the world sitting behind the goal at one end and think about how easy it would to get to get rid of them you know one sort of disease pandemic or a bomb or something like that and, and they're gone it's not a large number what about the tapanuli orangutan well as soon as it was discovered it became probably the most endangered great ape in the world with less than 800 individuals remaining they're only in the batantoro ecosystem nowhere else and they immediately uh, joined uh, the most recent list of the 25 world's most endangered primates. So that's, uh, that's, that presents a challenge. <clears throat> so what's the problem? Well, up here in northern Sumatra, it, it's habitat loss, basically. The number one problem is loss of the habitat. And uh, up in northern Sumatra here and Aceh, uh, one of the main drivers of habitat loss is palm oil. And palm oil plantations are not small. They're, they go on for miles and miles and miles. It's quite possible here to drive through nothing but palm oil for three, four, five hours. And uh, as you can see from the pictures, if you look at the bottom left here, nothing much lives in these plantations. So you go from a, a, a tropical rainforest with countless species. You know, there are trees that have 
uh, a thousand insect species that live only on that tree species and, and all these kind of things. But you go from that kind of scenario to, to a very barren landscape with uh, very few birds, mammals, and reptiles living there. And if you look at the top right here, you can see that when they clear the forest, it's not always done in a systematic matter, uh, a systematic way. Um, it's often done in blocks and piecemeal. So it's very easy to imagine how, how animals like orangutans and gibbons and, and many others get isolated in these little patches. And then they, they either stay where they are and starve to death or, or, or get, get burnt to death. Uh, or they have to run across these barren landscapes, uh, exposing themselves to all sorts of other dangers to try and get somewhere else. So why does this happen? Well, it's simply because we keep buying the stuff, yeah? It, it's a difficult product to avoid because it is so ubiquitous. It's in a lot of your know, snacks and chocolates and uh, cosmetics and soaps and shampoos. Um, and this is what it looks like at the bottom right. It's kind of like a miniature coconut. So you see the palm oil comes from the yellow husk then you have the, the kind of shell and then inside you have the, the kernel and where you get kernel oil from. The problem for orangutans and all the other animals is that to get from a primary rainforest to a palm oil plantation, you have to go through this phase. And during this phase, you know, the forest is uh, either chopped down or bulldozed. Uh, it's often then burnt because that's by far the easiest way uh, to get rid of it. Uh, but during that process, pretty much everything that's living there is killed. And you can see on the top right picture here, there's one tiny little seedling in the middle, uh, uh, but everything else is gone. And that includes, you know, even down to your termites and your ants and your mushrooms and fungi or whatever. But pretty much everything is annihilated in this process. Nothing much survives. And that includes orangutans. So, uh, you know, the, the orangutans either if they're lucky, they may be able to move somewhere where there's still some remaining forest, but that's usually at carrying capacity already, and there's only so much food to go around. So somebody somewhere is going to be malnourished and maybe eventually starve to death, or they're going to come out of the forest and start raiding farm crops or villages crops uh, and be uh, persecuted for their trouble as, as pests, basically. They're often killed as pests. So you see the top left here, there's an orangutan here riddled with uh, you, call, you guys call them BB guns, BB gun pellets. Uh, and the picture on the bottom right here, I believe, is an orangutan from Borneo that had petrol poured over in, uh, many years ago and was, was burnt alive. <coughs> so what are we doing about it? Um, well, we started like 22 years ago as a very small organization. I have a picture of us with two people and one, one chair and a telephone. Um, but we're now uh, reasonable. We've got about 150 field uh, staff scattered over 10 main locations. Um, that includes the office in Medan and the Orangutan Haven here in the quarantine, which is also near Medan. We have an education center up in Bukitlawang at the edge of the national park. We have field research stations at Sikundur, Suat Belimbing, and Batankoro in the Tapanuli Orangutan range studying wild orangutans. And we have students from overseas uh, and also domestic students coming there to study the orangutans. And then we have a couple of reintroduction centers. So Jambi in the far south, uh, we're working with Frankfurt Zoological Society and Janto in the far north. Now, both of these uh, areas, the reintroduction centers are are forests where there are records of orangutans historically, but not in recent years. So in both of those areas, we're, we're reintroducing orangutans to the wild and we're actually creating, creating brand new wild populations. And the goal is to have um, several hundred in each. So we have viable new wild populations. As a, as a backup, my old boss, Gerald Darrell in Jersey, used to always say like the, you know, the safety net population. So if something goes wrong, with the original wild population, you, you haven't lost everything. You still have a backup from which you can try and build back. Uh, and that's the goal with the, the new populations in Jambi and Janto. And I never thought that we would ever face a potential scenario like that in my lifetime. But with COVID, it's something we can't uh, forget about. COVID should infect orangutans, although thankfully it hasn't yet, as far as we know. So, when we first started, our main goal was to establish a, 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 re a rescue and rehabilitation center for illegal pet orangutans. Uh, there used to be one in, in Bukit Lawang in Bohorok, but that hadn't really functioned legally or to international standards since around 1995. So I came here in 2001 and the first task was to try and set up a new center. Uh, this is what illegal pet orangutans look like. 
they're often chained up or kept in cages, uh, usually in filthy conditions, uh, very poor diet, little or no medical care. But the, 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 these animals are a byproduct of the forest loss. Uh, nobody is really going into the forest to capture an infant for the pet trade. There's no need to because there is enough of them around that they're uh, survivors of the forest conversion process. So a typical scenario is um, a big plantation goes in or somebody else goes in and clears a large area of forest. There are orangutans that live there. The females just particularly don't want to move from their, their home range, their natal range. Um, they end up bumping into people, people with machetes and guns or whatever. Then they get shot or, or hacked or clubbed to death. Uh, and if an infant survives that process, it's those kind of infants that get taken home and kept illegally as pets or into in the the illegal wildlife trade. But I always, so because of that, I always describe them as refugees. So our defini the definition of a refugee is someone who's, whose homeland is no longer available to them. And that very much applies to most of the uh, illegal orangutans that we confiscate. Um, they come from forests that don't exist anymore. So what happens next when we get an animal? Well, we bring it to our quarantine and rehabilitation center just outside Medan. Uh, it's fully equipped. We have a, a well-equipped uh, medical center there and a vet team. So usually we give them a couple of days just to relax and recuperate from their trip. Then we'll anesthetize them and give them full medical checks. We take uh, x-rays to check for tuberculosis, blood samples for hepatitis and, and, uh, and full body checks uh, and everything else. And we also give them ID. So we give them a, a tattoo of a code number and we take pictures of their dentition. Uh, for ID purposes, and then they have to go through a, a three-month quarantine period in, in isolation to make sure that none of the orangutans already at the centre uh, get anything. Um, if they have anything, they're treated during that period, and then once the vets uh, announce them fit and well, they go to large cages at the back of the site uh, where they're introduced to other orangutans, and often that's for the first time since it's the first time they've met another orangutan since they were captured and their mother was killed. Um, so this is always a really nice time. Sometimes you see the, a new sort of look in their eyes, a new enthusiasm for life once they realize that they're, they're actually orangutans and there are others like them, uh, rather than weird, hairy humans, as they might have thought before. But this is where you also start to see their characters come out. You see the ones that are dominant, the ones that are subordinate, the ones that are, uh, you know, confident and all this kind of stuff. And you see the ones that are smart and the ones that are maybe a bit stupid and are going to take a little bit longer to rehabilitate. During, during this phase as well, uh, well, we also have uh, infant facilities as well. So some of the animals we get are very young uh, and still need 24-hour care. So we have a special facility with a keeper sleeping overnight. So if they, are, if they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning demanding uh, a bottle of milk, we can do that. And then... So, the ones that we can still handle, most of them we can still handle. Occasionally you get some quite aggressive ones, probably because they've been mistreated by their owners. But the, uh, the ones that we can still handle get taken out of the cages regularly into the nearby uh, forests. And uh, there they learn things that, you know, learn that like branches break and bend and you can fall. Uh, and, and they learn that some foods are nice and some are really bitter to the taste. And they learn that some insects are nice to eat and some of them bite back. So, so this is where they really start learning uh, the skills they're going to need once they're released into the wild and having to survive in the forest once again. So, like I said, we're using these animals to create new wild populations. So what from the quarantine center, they'll go up to one of the rescue centers, uh, reintroduction centers. Um, they usually travel as a group of friends, four or five together, so that when they arrive, they, they, they have familiar orangutans around them. And oftentimes when they get there, there are orangutans in the forest near the cages that they go to uh, that they also recognize because they used to live with them at the quarantine center. So down in Jambi, we've been releasing orangutans with Frankfurt since uh, 2003. We've now released 198 into the Bugit Tigapulu National Park. And then in Janto in the far north, we've now released almost 150 since 2011. And like I say, the aim is to have viable, genetically viable, long-term sustainable populations there. So we want to be releasing around 350 in each location, uh, with the goal being to have at least 250 surviving and reproducing uh, orangutans living in each population. The Janto site is really, really nice, really special. We often have otters in the river, but the river we can cross uh, by foot most of the time. 
uh, and we have you know, the human facilities at one side and the orangutan facilities at the other side of the river, uh, which is really, really conducive to uh, the reintroduction program, keeping the people and orangutans separate as much as possible. It's difficult to get to these forests sometimes. If it was easy, they wouldn't be there anymore, probably. Uh, both of our locations rely heavily on uh, off-road vehicles, which break down a lot, it's very expensive. Uh, this vehicle here is actually white when you get all the mud off. And, uh, and sometimes we have interesting challenges too. So this is my driving up on the top right here, I managed to turn one of the cars over. Uh, on the bottom left, you see a snake coming out of the glove box. There was a young Indonesian vet student sitting in the passenger seat there and she got out of the car very, very quickly. Uh, and on the bottom right here, you see this tiger that came up and just sat down in front of our canteen uh, for three hours watching the people come and go, which is quite an experience. Once we release orangutans, we don't just let them go and say goodbye. We have teams following them from dawn to dusk and they're recording their behavior and their diet every two minutes in exactly the same way that uh, people study the wild orangutans so we can compare all that data. But we also have teams going out on smart patrols into remote areas of the forest, uh, checking on evidence of orangutan presence and absence. And if they bump into individuals, uh, trying to get photos and ID the individuals. And in this way, we've found that quite a few of the orangutans that we haven't seen for a long time uh, are still surviving and doing quite well. So when you release an orangutan, sometimes they stay in the local area and very gradually over several years expand their range. Uh, and sometimes, especially the ones that maybe haven't been in captivity for that long and learned a lot from their mothers because they spent quite a few years with them, uh, just go off in a straight line for several kilometers and you may not see them again. So it's really important to try and keep track of uh, the survival rates and all those kind of things. We do our best. It's really nice now as well to see these populations breeding. Back in, we started reintroductions in Jambi back in 2003, and we've had the first infants there somewhere around 2008. Uh, we always knew it would take several years because most of the orangutans we, we released to the wild are around uh, six or seven years old. And wild orangutans typically have their first infant around 15 years of age. So we always knew there would be a gap. But now in Ache, we're also seeing infants born. This was the first one we know we know about born in, in uh, Ache, in Janto, in the new population there in 2017. And it's an interesting story for me, this one, because I actually helped confiscate Marconi from a police officer in Ache. Uh, she was very small and skinny and terrified. She tried to bite me, but she couldn't, she didn't have the energy. Um, we managed to get her fit and well. She was reintroduced into Janto, I think, in the end of uh, 2012. Um, then we didn't see her for a couple of years. And then she came back about 2014, 15, uh, and climbed into the cage because she had a broken shoulder. Uh, we brought her back to the quarantine center. Our Swiss surgeon friend flew over and operated on that. We released her again in 2015, I think. Uh, and then we didn't see her again either. And then a couple of years later, she stands up with this young male infant uh, named Masson. Uh, the first infant we know born in the wild in Janta to a, a mother that we released there. But it's always really nice for me. If, uh, if I go here and I see the orangutans that we released and I remember their story, where they came from and the ordeal they've been through and see them up in the trees looking down at me and not interested in any way if I'm there or not, uh, it's really, really re rewarding because it, you know we've, we've achieved success. But when they come back with infants as well, it's, it's even you, you get a warm glow all over. Yeah? Uh, I never cease to get that that thrill of seeing these animals in the wild. And uh, I always realize, you know, that Mar Mar Massin here has never known human contact. Uh, and he's a founder of a new population of orangutans. And it, it always reminds me, I, I always think of this thing like, so in, in the US, if, if you guys can trace your ancestors back to the Pilgrim Fathers on the Mayflower or something, you're really proud of that fact. And in Australia, they're really proud of, uh, in Adelaide, if they can trace their back to the first people who came to Australia voluntarily rather than convicts. Uh, uh, and, and I can see several generations down the line in, in, in a place like Janto, you've got the orangutans saying, oh, I'm from the Marconi line or whatever, one of the original release orangutans. Just to mention COVID, COVID reared its ugly head just over two years ago. Um, there was a paper published fairly quickly that uh, 
suggested are all African and Asian primates should contact, should be able to contract uh, the COVID virus because they have the same 12 enzymes that the, the virus binds to in humans. So we immediately sort of uh, assessed the situation. Uh, we realized we needed to quickly build an isolation unit, which you see on the top right here, uh, which is surrounded by a wall and meshed over. So new arrivals are processed in here to keep them away from the other orangutans or any orangutans we suspect that may be positive are put in here. Um, that went on automatically. We didn't have the funds for it at the time, but we managed to raise the funds pretty quickly with the crowdfunding uh, campaign. Uh, we also had to equip the team with uh, protective equipment, which was an extra expense. And uh, we had to implement new standard operating procedures to try and minimize the risks, which we are still uh, implementing now. But uh, we also anticipated a drop in funding uh, as donors you know, tightened their belts. Um, so we intensified our fundraising and, and we've managed to do OK so far, but it has been a challenge. And it's still a challenge. So far, we haven't, we, we test the staff every month. We've had staff test positive. So far, we haven't had any orangutans test positive, but we're working and we're working with the, the other orangutan centers throughout Indonesia and the government, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry to monitor the health of the orangutans very closely. Uh, but so far, no confirmed positive cases yet. But uh, one of the issues here is that we don't know the, because of that, we don't know the effect it will have on them. We don't know whether it's likely to kill 90% or hardly affect them at all. We, we simply don't know. We have no clue still. So we're still super cautious. So what are the problems facing the wild orangutans? Well, this is the Losa ecosystem again on the left. Uh, this shows sort of forest loss between 2001, 2019. Um, you can see that the main core forest is still there. But most of that is high mountains, so orangutans don't live there. They live in the lowlands around the edge. Orangutans, uh, optimal orangutan habitat on this map on the left would be white or orange. It's the lowland, the flat alluvial plains and the peat swamps uh, between, the, between the mountains and the coast. Uh, where I am right now in Medan would have been like optimum orangutan habitat. When you see them in the mountains, you're seeing them in less than optimum habitat. They're, they're surviving at the foothills. Um, but they don't, they much prefer these flat alluvial plains, but they've mostly gone. But you can see as well that even though it's illegal to open up sort of plantations in most of this forest, um, there's a still a lot of encroachment around the edge, nibbling away, and the forest gets smaller and smaller. And if you can see sort of around the middle of that map to the right a little bit and up, you can see some long white lines. Uh, with red dots and yellow dots on it. And these are roads that are cutting through the forest. And roads are always a, a problem because they they potentially cut a viable population in, into smaller units that are no longer viable. And uh, it's it's kind of interesting to think about that because you orangutans can cross a road, but once you open up a road in Indonesia, then settlement tends to go in and a road goes from five meters wide to five kilometers wide in a couple of decades. Um, but even birds, I was very surprised, you know, so, some songbirds, they're, they're so keyed into a certain humidity and temperature and light level that they won't go within 500 meters of the edge of a road. So even birds, of some many species of birds won't cross a road in the forest. So these roads are devastating for many, many wildlife species. Um, you can see an area as well on the left of that map, which is very red and yellow. That's what we call the tripper peat swamps, which has had a lot of problems over the years. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about that. And you can see there's been a lot of forest loss down in the far south uh, around the Sinkhill swamps. And then up in the northeast, uh, again, like I say, nibbling away at the edges, uh, the forest getting smaller and smaller. Like I said, the, the trip of peat swamp. So I'm a big fan of peat swamp forests. I did my PhD in, in the Suwap Limbing Research Station, which is on this map in the Cluet peat swamp. Uh, they're horrible places to work for people, uh, very difficult to get through the vegetation, it's very dense, a lot of thorns, uh, and, and it's, it's very wet. You know, in the dry season, it's up to your knees, and in the wet season, it can be up to your shoulders. Uh, so very difficult to work in, but paradise for orangutans. These, uh, your average density of orangutans in most of Borneo is like uh, 0.8 to 1.5 per square kilometer, something like that. Uh, and then on the east side of uh, Loser, uh, probably around 2, 2.5 max. 
But once you get into these peat swamps, you, you can get densities up as high as eight or more per square kilometer. So real uh, orangutan paradise. But peat swamps are, are, are exactly that, they're peat. And peat is all the sort of leaves and branches and dead insects and dead tigers and elephants and things that fall into the, the swamps and they don't, the, the carbon doesn't decompose because it's anaerobic and there's no oxygen there. So this carbon builds up over thousands of years. And uh, the amount of carbon in these swamps is vast. So I'm, I'm a bit out of touch from the peat experts, but when I was following this more closely about 10, 15 years ago, uh, I think Indonesia had like 56% of the world's tropical peatlands uh, and locked up in the world's tropical peatlands is around four to 16 times the amount of CO2 that's in the atmosphere today. So essentially I'm saying that if you lose these peat salt forests, we have a serious problem. So this is a global issue. It's not just about saving the orangutan, saving this or that. It's about it's about human habitat and the, and the health of this planet. It's a really is what happens here impacts everybody around the world, and everybody needs to be concerned about it. We have had some successes. We haven't saved the triple beach swamps. We haven't given up yet, but uh, we've had some legal successes. Uh, our partners at Wali in Aceh were successful in challenging uh, an illegal farm oil permit granted in Tripa in, uh, I think, like 2008 or 2009. It was clearly illegal because it contravened a national moratorium, uh, and they managed to get that cancelled and closed down. But then after the... So, so Tripa was basically opened up in the 90s. Uh, large areas of land were cleared and burnt. Uh, but not all of the concessions. So most of the concessions that were granted in the early 90s, you know, maybe they managed to clear 25% or 50%. Uh, and then Aceh was plunged into a separatist conflict in the, like 1998. Uh, and work stopped. So these plantations became abandoned. And, uh, and they start to regrow. I was amazed at the, the degree of natural regrowth. You don't necessarily need to replant forests. They come back amazingly well. Uh, on their own if you give them a chance. Um, but then after the tsunami, there was a peace deal uh, and these plantations went back to work in like 2007 and they immediately started clearing more land and, and using fire to do that, which is very, which is illegal in Indonesia, clearing forests using fire. Um, we managed to get those images onto, you know, international news and into the hands of the government in Jakarta uh, and to the point where the Ministry of Environment took uh, several of the companies to court. And uh, they were successful. They managed to get uh, one company uh, was fined around $26 million. And that was the biggest fine ever against a concession holder in Indonesia at that time. Subsequently, one of the other companies was fined like a couple of years later, around $33 million. And the problem is they haven't paid those. So I think the, the, these cases were precedent setting and the government hasn't really got it doesn't have a lot of experience of pushing these cases through and getting these fines paid. And the companies, of course, are not uh, weak. They're quite powerful. And so they try every effort they can. Every, you know, they counter sue. They try, you know, they're very slippery. They try and avoid paying fines, delay, find, you know, the, the, the judge was wearing the wrong color shoes that day, you know, and then you end up wasting another six months debating that one. Um, so these, these fines should still be paid. And they should actually, I think one of them, 20, 20, uh, $20 million should go into the restoration of the habitat that was destroyed. So, like I say, we haven't given up on TRIPA, but uh, it's proving a very long and difficult process, even though we've had some major legal successes uh, against offenders. It's a very interesting case. What about the Tapanuli orangutans? What's their situation? Well, as, as I said, they're in a very small uh, forest south of Lake Toba. But already that forest and the orangutan population is split into more than one block. So if you look at the, on the right here, you see the dark green forest, that's what we call the west block. There's estimated to be around 500 individuals in there. If you look at the slightly uh, yellower block, this, that's the east block, and then we estimate around 150 individuals living in there. And they're not connected. There's a main road that drives through between them. Oh, a helicopter just went past. So that's quite unusual. Sorry about that. Um, 
And then uh, we have this red blob at the bottom, which is uh, the Super Warp Wiley area. And we you know, there's probably a couple of dozen orangutans in there. But you see how vulnerable the connection is between that and the west block as well. So, And also, we're losing forest as well. Most of this habitat is protected status. It's not conservation forest, but it is legally protected. So out of bounds for new concessions. But again, we still get this nibbling away, this encroachment at the forest edge. You can see down on the the bottom there in the middle there's a lot of encroachment from villages into the into the lowland areas of the west block and then on the right there's actually an enclave in the middle with some villages in it and that's getting bigger and bigger and there's encroachment from the eastern side as well so it's an ever-present problem so even though you have a, a protected forest you're still losing it uh, by this constant nibbling away at the edges now the solution here to the Tapanuli orangutan is corridors. You know, we really, if we, the, the Western population at 500 is considered genetically viable and sustainable in the long term, if we don't lose any habitat and if the orangutans are not hunted, it's enough to be genetically healthy. Uh, the population on the right in the Eastern block is too small. It's not big enough. So if we don't connect those animals back to the Western block, we will probably lose them from you know, just, just population deterioration and inbreeding and all those different things. And if we don't keep a connection between uh, the West block and the, the Southern ones, uh, we will lose them as well. So corridors is a, is a, is a, is, is a key to keeping the Tappan and the orangutan on planet Earth. Uh, but it's something that not many people have a lot of experience of here. Um, a lot of the land between these forests is, is usually owned by private individuals, smallholder farmers. Um, it might be possible to buy land in some cases, uh, but in other ways, in, in other cases where we can't buy the land, the only solution is to work with the farmers and try and uh, help them or find ways, financial incentives for them to manage their land in ways that orangutans are still able to cross and, and not persecuted as they do so. So it's a, it's a challenge, but uh, something we really have to work hard on. Otherwise, we will lose these animals. Um, if we're not careful, you know, some of the younger people in the audience today, it's quite possible that the Tabernacle orangutan could be described to science and and also extinct within within their lifetime. The numbers are just so so few, and the threats are just so many. But the orangutans are trying. Uh, this is a photograph of Tabernacle orangutan twins. Twins are not uh, common in orangutans, but they, they do occur occasionally. Uh, but this is just a little sign that the orangutans uh, in Tapanuli are also trying to boost their own numbers as quick as possible in some cases. For me, the bottom line though is we, we've got to, no matter, no matter orangutans, whatever, but we've got to save these forests. The Loza ecosystem is an amazing place, as uh, Stanley mentioned. I've flown over it, I've walked through it, I've swam through bits of it in the swamps uh, and it's just an incredible place and I bumped into beautiful waterfalls that nobody knew were there uh, and all of these different things but Losa is the only place in the world where you can find the rhino the tiger the elephant and the orangutan living side by side further south in the island you don't have the orangutan or in Tapanuli you don't have the rhinos um, so this is the only place in the world it's actually I think people often say like, it's the closest thing to the jungle book in terms of the species that live there. There's no other uh, place that comes closer. But we're losing them. Uh, several years ago, I was on Facebook, if you remember Facebook. Um, the, uh, and I, it suddenly struck me that I was seeing reports of elephants being killed or dying or whatever on, on an almost weekly basis. So I, I looked into the government records and I, I believe 2016, there was something like 36 or seven cases that were known to the government uh, in 2017. I think it was a bit over 40. Uh, and I, you know, realizing that maybe there are cases as well that we don't know about, we're probably losing an elephant every week. And the, est the most recent estimates were around 1,200 individuals remaining throughout the island. Um, so do the maths. We're, we're going to lose uh, elephants in Sumatra in about 20, 25 years from now, probably sooner because the populations are already getting fragmented and smaller. There are some groups I know of where there are no males any longer. Um, so I'm extremely concerned about Sumatran elephants. And if I, if I manage to live long enough, it's, it's certainly possible that I will witness the last elephant death on Sumatra if we don't do something drastic 
uh, very, very soon. The, the, the traditional sort of methods of elephant conservation, of you know, educating people, helping communities improve their livelihoods, don't seem to be working. Uh, we need something radically different. I think the only solution is to actually reclaim plantations. Elephants don't like land that is more than 15% slope, and almost all of that in Sumatra it now is under plantation development, whether it's uh, palm oil or acacia or whatever. But we have to talk to the private sector because the only solution is there. If we don't, we'll, if we don't, we'll just sit and watch the elephants go extinct, possibly in my lifetime. But then when I give talks like this, there's always somebody at the end who puts their hand up and says, but surely we need economic development too, you know? You just can't just say, drop everything and save the fluffy monkeys, right? So I started thinking about this years ago and, and, and when I see uh, information, I, I, I jump on it. But this is a picture from Kalimantan where there are large areas of peatland. But the, the evidence is that once you, once you clear the forest from peat swamps, um, you release countless tons of uh, carbon into the atmosphere during that process. But you also, and then you drain the peat and you dry it out. And as soon as you do that, the carbon in the peat oxidizes too and CO2 is released constantly. And as that happens, the, the peat layer, it goes down, it compacts. And it can, compacts on average about 2.5 meters in, 20, in the first 25 years. So in the lifetime of your first crop of palm oil, the land itself goes down 2.5 meters. Now, a lot of these peat swamps are at, you know, very close to or not very high above sea level. And look, imagine Tripper, most of it's, uh, you know, almost at sea level already. So you're going to go into, a company goes into an area, they clear the forest, they kill just about everything that lives there. They release massive amounts of carbon into the atmosphere during the clearing and burning process. And then the land degrades, goes down 2.5 meters. And then in 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you're going to see the sea coming in and reclaiming this area. So this is economic suicide. This is not economic development. Somebody somewhere gets rich from that process. They probably don't live in that area. They probably live in Jakarta or Singapore or even London or Washington, wherever. Uh, somebody gets rich during that process, but you end up throwing the land itself into the sea. And that's not sensible. And that's not sustainable economic development in any way. And then this is a picture of uh, Tamiang in the east of Losa. There were some flash floods there in 2006, uh, largely caused by, I think, three uh, illegal palm oil developments up in the higher watershed where they cleared the forest, not plantations, but sort of private individuals from Medan, if I recall. Uh, and the result of that was these series of flash floods in during 19 days in 2006. And these floods destroy entire villages and kill a lot of people. Uh, you see here, you know, the hillside comes down and all the trees on it. So it's basically like a blender. It's, it's a grinder comes down the mountainside and wipes away your town and your village and your grandmother and your kids and the school and the road and, and all, all your investment in your rice paddy from the profits you made from last year's crop also destroyed. So you get stuck in this rut. And, um, you know, the World Bank looked at this and they concluded that these floods cost uh, in just 19 days, cost in the region of 210 million US dollars. And I'm sat there thinking, who paid this bill? Is it, you know, is it the three guys from Medan that caused the problem? Or is it the local villages and the local government that don't have a budget for that? Um, so again, you're seeing that you know, somebody's making money, but everybody else is having to pay. And this is not economic development. This is economic, well, whatever, robbery. Yeah? And then on a national scale, I'm looking at this report, The Cost of Fire by the World Bank in 2016. They looked at the cost of uh, the haze during 2015. A lot of fires uh, throughout Southeast Asia, well, throughout Indonesia, that caused a haze throughout Southeast Asia. Um, and they concluded that the fires cost the state in terms of um, lost business opportunities, lost hotel rooms, lost flights, uh, health costs for respiratory diseases but also massive losses to the agricultural sector because you know, plants and, and palm oil uh, palms didn't see the sun for six months. Uh, this picture on the left could be easily be at 12 o'clock during the day. 
it was that black in many areas. And uh, they reckon that this, you know, this whole event cost the state around 16 billion US dollars. Uh, and compare that to the sort of average revenue they get in a year, uh, around 8 billion US dollars. It's, uh, it's, you know, I think the, the economic exa arguments exist when you're on the private sector level. But I was just reading this report by the UN the other day, the T report, which is looking at the economics of, of sustainability. Uh, and, and most indus industries have internal costs and they have external costs. Uh, external costs is their pollution, their, their in impact on water supplies, their impact on uh, the local economy. But they don't have to factor that into their audit reports. Once companies have to factor those external externalities and external costs into their order reports, most of them are not economically viable. And that's the conclusion of the UN team report. So, yeah, I, I have a, I struggle to get my head around this economic argument. I, I think a lot of this damage, a lot of this loss, a lot of this destruction is not actually justified economically. So I used, you know, you, you used to hear this thing, you know, you can have conservation or you can have economic development. I don't see them as different. I see conservation and sustainable long-term economic development as exactly the same thing. I see conservation and uh, the raiding or the destruction of natural resources for short-term gain are very different. But conservation and long-term sustainable economic development, the numbers to me uh, uh, suggest that's exactly the same thing. Anyway, on a happier note, I'm going to talk about the Orangutan Haven. Uh, a little bit. The, this is what it looks like. It's an exciting new development here in North Sumatra, just uh, 30, 40 minutes from the city of Medan. Medan has around 2.5 million people officially, probably more like 3.5 million people unofficially. Um, the reason we came up with this idea is that most of the orangutans that we've received over the years can be released to the wild, but we've accumulated eight individuals that can never be released. Uh, an example is Losa here on the left, uh, blind in both eyes. And this is the x-ray that you saw earlier. He's got two pellets in one eye and one in the other. Uh, so he'll never be a wild orangutan again. Um, Dek Nong next to him has a chronic arthritic condition that we will never cure. Uh, so these animals will never be wild. So I'm sat there thinking, um, orangutans can live for 50 years. Are they going to spend the next 40 years living in metal cages, no matter how big they might be at the quarantine? Um, but then I remembered several years ago that when I was at Jersey Zoo, we built these ni nice naturalistic islands surrounded by water moats. Uh, the vegetation has grown up on those. They've got climbing structures. And I thought, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could find somewhere here where we could do something like that uh, and give these animals a much better quality of life for the rest of their days? Uh, just uh, another example, another orangutan that will end up here is Fadrin on the bottom right here. So Fadrin, we know, was put in this cage in 1998 because his name is Ed, not Fadrin, Chris Mon because his name is Chris Mon, which means Money to Crisis, which was 1998. And he entered that cage through that little door, probably as a very young infant. Uh, and he's been there, he was there 19 years. So he has muscular problems and, and psychological problems from being unable to move more than a meter to the left or right uh, over that 19 year period. Um, so we started looking for land where we might be able to develop some islands. So we needed a, a valley, a wetland valley with a, with a water source on site. So we know it's not polluted if the orangutans drink it. Uh, we found such a site just 40 minutes from Medan. Uh, you can see this green area in the middle of the, the map there. Um, but it came as a package. So we, we were originally looking for like one, uh, 12 hectares or so to do this. Uh, the package was 50 hectares. We managed to scrape some loans together in Switzerland and, and bought, the, bought the land. Um, but because the land area is so much bigger than we originally envisaged, our vision for the Orangutan Haven is also so much bigger. We really want to use this opportunity to educate people, educate the people of Medan, uh, which includes the directors of a lot of palm oil companies and infrastructure and mining pro companies. Uh, and we really want to get them out here and change the way they think and change their perceptions. And we also want to get the schools and universities involved as well. So we want to have a school, we want to have exhibitions, we want to have showcase green technology, we have micro hydro or solar on site. These are all assets that we can use for education and changing things. And we also have land for other species conservation projects. So we've managed to build these islands. This is a drone shot taken last week. Uh, 
It's actually a little video. There you go. So it's it's uh, each island has access to a house, so the orangutans can get out, uh, sleep indoors safely or get out the rain and the sun. Um, they've got plants growing on them. The access is via a little bridge, and we also have a keeper bridge that swings out, so the keepers can get on and keep these areas clean. Um, and we have nine anim uh, We have eight animals. Three of them are females. So the three females we want to mix with males. So we will we will have five little groups, uh, individuals or pairs. So we need five of these islands. So we have rooms uh, room to cater for more orangutans in the future if we need to. It's a beautiful spot. Uh, even every time I go there, I'm just amazed at how stunning it is. Uh, when we move the animals in, which hopefully will be in the middle of this year, we're, we're still finalizing a zoo license, which allows us to keep protected species and charge an entrance ticket. Uh, so we will have more climbing structures and hammocks on the islands for the animals then. Uh, this is just another couple of images to show you what it looks like. People, uh, visitors will be able to come on guided tours around here uh, and up onto the top of that building and see the orangutans at eye level. Just another shot. We, we're, we're, trying to, we're using sustainable construction techniques. You see both the building on the left, which is a security post, and the the orangutan house on the right have green roofs, living roofs. Uh, we, every, all these things, we, again, we want to use as, as, as teaching resources. E even the buildings we, be, we build, we want them to be uh, function as uh, education resources. Examples of different ways of doing things. Video, very quick. The, the plants and vegetation have grown so well that even with orangutans on there, we hope a lot of that survives, although they will destroy some of it. But it is quite a spectacular place. Uh, we hope to have the license within a couple of months. So like I said, moving orangutans in around August. And it's going to be incredible to see some of those big males uh, wandering around and swinging through these uh, islands. Um, we've also been working with the uh, International Union of Conservation of Nature, the IUCN's uh, Asian Songbird Trade uh, Specialist Group. The many songbird species here are, are over harvested and collected because they sing well. And if they sing well, they can make a lot of money in competitions. Uh, some species like the straw headed bulbul on the bottom right here are almost extinct in Indonesia. The Nias minor bird there is extinct in Nias. Um, there are birds in captivity and some people are breeding them, but they tend to breed <coughs> breed the ones from Sumatra, a male from Sumatra with a female from Kalimantan or from Malaysia. And so we're losing all these uh, original, you know, these races and, song, and subspecies. So the goal here is uh, to captive breed some of these critically endangered species uh, so we don't lose these uh, subspecies and races forever. Like I said, everything we built here, we're trying to use as an example. So we're showcasing sustainable materials and sustainable ways of doing things. Uh, you can even see uh, on the bottom right here, the, the male and female sign are made out of beer bottles stuck in the, in the wall there. But the main uh, potential of the Haven is education. The, the education potential is huge. Like I said, around three, three and a half million people, just 45 minutes away, uh, thousands of schools. We're working with the European Zoo Association education teams to develop a master plan and, and modules. We already get uh, visited by schools. We've already got modules on some subjects to catering for different age groups. And these are aligned with uh, some national curricula so that the schools actually need and want to use them. Uh, and our plan for the Haven uh, phase one is progressing well. We The islands are done. Um, the organic farm we have in place, we have amazing drawings for a new restaurant here and an exhibition center, a school facility. But the idea here is to generate sustainable funding uh, from visitors and the restaurant to fund the other work of the Haven, but also in our dreams to fund other work of the SOCP and the conservation of the wild orangutans as well. So the whole point here now is sustainable funding for conservation. It's quite ironic and scary a bit, I think, when everybody agrees that the, the, the big issues of our time, our era, or our kids' era uh, is climate change and biodiversity loss. That's why we have pandemics and all these other problems. Uh, and yet conservation is still largely funded by uh, donations and handouts. Uh, to me, that suggests something is, is badly wrong with our financial systems, our economic systems. But we, we have an, a, an ambitious plan for a major restaurant that I think will be 
uh, very, very popular. Um, like I said, I think demand is not our problem, so we'll be able to manage pricing and control numbers that way. But it's uh, it's going to be a spectacular place uh, once we manage to build this. We have, like I said, we have these detailed drawings, but we don't have the money to build it. So that's that's my next challenge for the next sort of 12, 12 to 18 months is to find the funding to build this. Uh, and we're also uh, employing a lot of local villages. Uh, the two villages there, we, we're working closely with them. We want to also use our organic farm and everything to uh, experiment and teach and train. Um, but we're also hoping to be able to explore new markets for new products, niche products that, that might help the local economy sort of boost their incomes uh, in ways that they've never really thought of before. They tend to, in the area, grow a mixture of fruit and vegetables or they grow um, you know, coffee or chocolate. Uh, and they don't often think outside the box, whereas there are all sorts of options like essential oils and all these different things that we can try and explore. So I'm just about to finish. So the my, the take home, I mean, what what have what have I learned over the years? Um, well, one of them is this quote by Margaret Mead. I really like this. Uh, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Uh, I think this one really hits it. The nail on the head you know anybody can do anything I, I i'm a zookeeper from england i think we've achieved things here that i never dreamed we could do and 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 the, the reason we've done it is because we we didn't back out we didn't say no we just put one foot in front of the other and uh, it's amazing what you can achieve when you do that um one of the reasons why we were quite successful with the legal campaigns was that we got a lot of support from around the world social media has changed the way uh, people communicate and the way things are done uh, and and if you get smart you can use that to uh, build up support uh, massive support uh, and very quickly sometimes uh, it's a very effective uh, way of getting messages out there and and, and raising support for issues uh, and we've been so successful that <coughs> we even have people like leo dicaprio there and stella mccartney tweeting about the rosa ecosystem when 20 years ago if i went outside of north sumatra nobody had ever heard of it uh, so things have changed. We have achieved some successes. We put the Losa ecosystem on the map for sure. Whether we've saved it or not is a different issue. But the other thing I always try and get to across to people as well is that um, it's, it's not just me and the team here that's going to save the orangutan. We're quite the opposite. It's, it's people like you and everybody else around the world, and especially the younger generation who are going to take over from where we left off. Uh, but also we couldn't do any of the work that we do without funding support, without sort of political support, without networking, uh, all these different things. So everybody has a role to play in this. And indeed, as I mentioned earlier, this is a global issue. Uh, what happens in these forests affects everybody everywhere. So everybody needs to play a role. Um, and with that, I'd say thank you very much. I realize I've gone a little bit over time. Um, but uh, if anybody wants to follow us on social media and things, they can. Thank you very much, Ethan, uh, Ian, for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, I'm going to moderate the questions going forward. Uh, so uh, I see some of you have popped some questions in. If you have any other questions uh, while we continue, uh, please continue to throw them into the chat, uh, and I will uh, bring them up uh, for Ian to answer. Uh, to start us off, um, it's really exciting to see the successes you're having on Sumatra with the orangutan conservation uh, and your continued activism efforts. Um, and I think you painted a really great, albeit dark picture for us today on the various threats that are facing orangutans and the other members of this uh, mega diverse region that is uh, Indonesia. I wanted to bring in uh, some of what you mentioned a little bit closer to the homes of those of us that live in Colorado. Uh, so uh, many orangutans on um, both Sumatra and on Borneo, where I work, live in the peat swamp forest that you've mentioned several times in your talk. Uh, this peat is very carbon rich and is very flammable. Uh, for all of us here in Colorado, we are unfortunately all too familiar with wildfires and the damage and harm that they can bring. But what makes the peat swamp fires in Indonesia really dangerous is one, the fires can burn and smolder underground, which makes them very difficult to combat. Uh, and because the peat is very carbon rich, it releases much more harmful smoke uh, than from tree and vegetation burning alone. 
Uh, in fact, the, the, the fires occur in Indonesia on their annual basis, and the smoke that they release has uh, led to more than uh, 100,000 excess human deaths every year uh, in the region of Southeast Asia, uh, and has been shown to have significant negative health impacts on orangutans on Borneo, uh, and presumably also on Sumatra. Uh, so this leads into my uh, first question. So sometimes the needs of orangutans uh, and their forests conflict with the needs of local human communities. Uh, for example, the forest I'm working in, a road was just put in, uh, which several of the villages along the river really wanted because it increases their access to healthcare and education um, and improves their ability to find jobs uh, outside of the immediate vicinity of their village. Um, at the same time, this road increases access for loggers to get into the forest and is also leading to a significant drainage of the paint swamp, uh, which is negatively impacting the forest and increasing its risk of catching fire. So how do you balance the conservation needs of orangutans and their forest habitats uh, with the needs of local human communities? I think it's, uh... It's something that I touched on there. I think <clears throat> what we need to do is start looking at the numbers. And I think, you know, okay, at the, at the individual level, some people may see economic benefits from these kinds of developments. Uh, certainly the people that own the plantation companies and stuff do. Um, but the individuals at the local level as well may see some economic benefits. But if you look at the numbers and look at the, then the costs over the next 20, 30, 40 years to the local economy, uh, what's the balance? And I'm, I'm fascinated to look at this because I think for years, conservationists have been fighting against this economic argument. And I'm not convinced it really exists. And I think, you know, this is what we really need to be focusing on now. So really, let's look at the economics. And I think the UN TEAB group, I've forgotten what TEAB stands for. It's like the Economics of Environment and something or other. Um, is doing some great work. And I think once people realize, I mean, their conclusion was that once you once industries and they looked at a whole range of industries you know textiles oil everything uh, once you factor in all the externalities the costs that are not borne by the company but borne by the local economy and the local government and the local people uh, no industry in the world is economically viable not one and um you know this is what we need to look at we need to we need to be able to provide if we're going to compete with the economic uh, you know, the, the industrial sector, we need to come up with these numbers and uh, we need to show that there's no real economic argument there. Uh, and the economic argument for the, in the long term is clear, you know, you, it's, I think that's a no brainer. You know, you can make a bit of money now, but uh, long term, you're destroying your economic potential. Uh, and, and I think that's where we need to go. Uh, well, another interesting thing, a phenomenon as well that I see here a lot, uh, maybe less so in less apparent in Borneo, but the you around the Losa ecosystem, so you've got this amazing forest in these mountains and everything else, and you've got all this water coming out of there uh, into the local area. And, and you know, Aceh is four million people, and everything in Aceh, the water comes out of those mountains. And so every individual, every industry, every farm, every rice paddy depends on the water coming out of those mountains. If you lose that, you've destroyed your economy, and you've certainly destroyed your economic potential over the long term. Um, but what you often find as well is plantations, they go, they go right up to the edge of the, the foothills and you end up with villages here that are trapped. So they can go into the plantations and try and make a livelihood, but they're not allowed to do that because these companies are good at keeping them out and there's nothing to do there anyway. Maybe graze a few goats or something. So they have no option but to go into the forest and look for livelihoods there. And, and you know, this is a real a real challenge. I mean, ecotourism is often seen as a, as a, as a potential solution to that, but uh, governance is so weak here that, you know, developing high-end ecotourism that generates uh, significant revenues for local economies is difficult. Uh, if you have one hotel that's successful, you can guarantee you'll be surrounded by a hundred of them within 10 years, uh, all charging a lower price uh, and, and destroy the area. Yeah, and we've seen that over and over again here. So. But I think going back, I think we really need to look at the economics and this UNT program is, is trying to do that. 
And I think once you do that, uh, the economic argument is all in favor of protecting these forests and protecting species like orangutan. Speaking of uh, and kind of continuing on the idea of, of uh, interactions between humans and orangutans, uh, one of the questions that came up was, how are you finding and identifying and dealing with the people who have taken wild orangutans home um, as pets or otherwise removing them from their habitats? <laughs> When, <clears throat> when I started, um, law enforcement was very difficult. Um, there's, there was always this argument that, oh, the people keeping orangutans are the poor villagers and stuff like that. That's not really true. Uh, a large proportion of the orangutans we've confiscated over the years uh, are held by police officers, uh, local government officials. They're people with, with wealth and influence. Prosecuting those people is, is very difficult. Uh, but having said that, um, I think social media has played a big role in putting pressure on the government to improve. Um, nowadays, if, if somebody, if there's a, an illegal orangutan or whatever go, gets onto the social media, it goes so wild that the government has to respond. Uh, so we've seen prosecutions increase. I think the first prosecution I know of, of, of somebody uh, trying to sell an orangutan was in, was in Borneo in 2012 in, in Western Borneo. Uh, since then, we've had a few in Sumatra, a few more in Borneo, but you're still talking about three or four a year uh, and the fines are, are not significant, but it, it is changing. But there, there is a government, um, the, the government is taking this way more seriously than it did 10, 20 years ago. And, and the number of prosecutions in wildlife crime and everything else is increasing. And, and this is one of the problems. I mean, it's it's totally illegal to shoot an orangutan, and yet it happens all the time. And uh, it's not the the number of prosecutions is not an effective deterrent. People know that the chances of being prosecuted are almost zero. <clears throat> and as far as I'm aware, too, every single case, every single prosecution relating to orangutans has been for sale. People trying to sell them. No, nobody, or maybe one or two people in the last sort of two years literally, uh, have been prosecuted for uh, harming an orangutan. And, as, and nobody, as far as I'm, I'm aware, has been prosecuted for just keeping one as a pet. Now, for the orangutans that you are able to rescue, um, either from their habitat being destroyed or them being shot or, or being kept as pets, um, for those that are deemed um, able to be released back into the wild, how do you how do you make that determination? Um, and what prohibits orangutans from being uh, released into the wild again? It's, it's many factors. I mean, uh, it, it, it's not an exact science, that's for sure. Um, <clears throat> but we, 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 we spend enough time with them and, and we give them enough opportunities to sort of explore the trees and forests with, with people that know the individuals very well uh, to, to, try and make, to try and assess um, their competence and the likelihood of survival. We don't give them exams. We don't sort of pigeon, you know, or you have to, you have to scratch your nose with both hands. Uh, you have to make a nest that weighs five kilograms and then you can move on. We don't have those kind of standards. Every individual is different. Uh, and I don't think that kind of uh, detail uh, really makes any sense. You, you Occasionally you find animals you think are stupid and are never going to survive and they do really, really well. And you think, you find animals that are the smartest you've ever seen and they do really, really badly. Um, so it's not an exact science. And sometimes we get it wrong uh, and, and, and they don't make it. You know, that, that's a necessary part of the thing. But I always feel like we're obliged to give them that chance. I mean, if, 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 you, if you say, right, I, I have a feeling you might not survive, so you're going to spend the next 58 years in the cage. I, I think I can't do that. I think if they have a chance of survival, I would rather give them that. Uh, and, and if they don't make it, then that's that's the consequences. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, the, the ones that we've still got that we, we've concluded are definitely never going to be wild again. I mean, they're, they, they're either blind uh, or they have some illness that just makes it ridiculous to even try or they have a physical weakness that uh, is going to make it difficult for them. And then the, the, the saddest case for me is Fadrin. There's a big male who came back from Malaysia several years ago. He grew up in captivity playing golf and doing cowboy shows. 
He's a big, handsome animal. He's, he's never had any health problems. But I just feel he's too dangerous to have him wandering around the forest where he might bump into a fisherman or whatever and not having that fear of humans. Uh, it, it's going to end in trouble. So he's going to spend his days in, in the haven as well. He's just too big and dangerous. Yeah. Now, you have spent a considerable amount of time over the course of your career with um, uh, dealing both with orangutan conservation and orangutans in rehab centers, as well as uh, orangutans in the wild. Um, and one of the questions that came up talks about the difficulties of finding and tracking a wild orangutans. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how, when you were in the wild with the orangutans, how you find them, um, what difficulties uh, present themselves while you're trying to stay with them during uh, focal follows. Yeah, I, I, I'm quite proud of that fact. I, I don't know anybody else that's worked with orangutans in sort of the captive zoo setting and, and studied wild ones and then worked in this conservation. Uh, business as well. So, um, yeah, following wild orangutans. I mean, I worked in the swamp most of the time, but I've also experienced in dryland forests. But you, 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 you basically to find them, you basically just wander around slowly, keeping as quiet as you can, and often sitting uh, still and, and doing nothing. Uh, it's it's surprisingly easy. Orangutans, you know, they they range from like fifty to hundred kilograms in weight. They're they're red. Uh, and they're in a green environment. And it but it's amazing how easy it is to walk past one. Uh, and, and I've even seen them hide, you know, actually go behind the trunk of a tree while you go past so they don't see you. Um, but usually you find them with your ears, actually, rather than your your eyes. You, you hear the fruit dropping or you hear a branch, uh, a tree sway, and it's a very different noise from other monkeys. So monkeys, when, they, when they're tra traveling, they jump onto branches, and it makes, whereas orangutans tend to, sway trees uh, and the noise that makes when they step off it and it sways back is very different from the noise when a monkey jumps on it so you get pretty good at that uh, but often you hear the the fruit dropping as well and stuff like that so it's usually with your ears and then keeping up with them i mean if you're if you're lazy and you know <laughs> you you can lose them but uh, there's no reason to lose an orangutan they don't travel that fast as long as you as long as the terrain is and you don't come up against a sheer 50 foot cliff that you can't climb up um there's no reason to lose them and and i, I i've lost very very few in my career here yeah. it's, it's you shouldn't you shouldn't lose them um with regards to wild orangutans uh <laughs> how large or how widespread was the extent of orangutan habitat in Indonesia uh, historically and have they always been uh, limited to the islands of Borneo and Sumatra? Um, <clears throat> if you look at the literature they, they, you know, there's all these references that orangutans used to or something very similar to a modern orangutan used to exist from Java uh, through Sumatra, Borneo, all the way up until southern China. And there's fossil evidence of orangutans down south in Sumatra as well. Um, but the, remember, this is the Sunda Shelf. So I don't know if people are aware, but the seas between uh, Malaysia and Borneo and Sumatra are very shallow. Uh, an Air Asia plane crashed uh, several years ago in the middle of nowhere, and it was very easy to see it from a, from a, a plane. You can just, it was only a few meters under the surface, even though it was in the middle of the sea. Um, very, very shallow. So there's been a land bridge as sea levels have gone up and down with ice ages and things. There's been land bridges many, many times uh, where the whole of the Southeast Asia shelf uh, was linked. Um, but yeah, orangutans were, were in Java at one point, but I don't think beyond that, I don't think there's any evidence of them getting to Bali or anything like that. The, the, another the other brings an interesting point, actually. This is the, in Sumatra, it's always been a bit of an enigma because even, you know, even, even today, you still get people say there are, there was an orangutan once in this forest way down south. Uh, and there's a very famous uh, French uh, botanist here that swears he saw orangutans down near Padang uh, in the late 60s. And he should know what an orangutan looks like. Um, but I, so I have this theory that, uh, you know, even 100 years ago, orangutans were probably throughout most of the island. But when that's when the forest sort of spread from the east coast to the west coast, almost un uninterrupted. Down south, there are indigenous people, the Orangkubu. Uh, and they will hunt orangutans. 
but they wouldn't have been able to wipe them out. But as the forests have been opened up and fragmented into smaller and smaller patches, then it becomes very easy for a hunter hunters to wipe out a local population and exterminate it. But again, orangutans lived for like 50, 60 years potentially. So it's not surprising really if there's still an orangutan somewhere down there wandering around and being seen by people occasionally. Speaking of uh, that uh, habitat fragmentation, um, you mentioned earlier on uh, the generation of corridors uh, to kind of improve uh, or, or help to combat that fragmentation. Um, I think a lot of us are probably familiar with uh, similar wildlife crossings over or under highways and roads in the States. Um, for orangutans, what do you envision these corridors to like look like? Ideally, we would buy the land and reforest it back to its original condition. If there's a road, if you take the forest right up to the left and right side of the road, orangutans will cross. Uh, and to, to make a genetic bridge, to, to ensure there's enough gene flow between two fragmented populations, you don't need a lot of movement. You only need like one female to move every 20 years or something, and, and as long as she has kids when she gets there. Um, so you don't need every orangutan to cross the road every day. Um, so they could be, you know, more agroforest, more mixed landscapes, but the important is, thing is that people don't kill them. You know, orangutans in Borneo especially will, will cross large open areas. I, I have this theory, the line of sight, if they can see some forest before the horizon, they're, they're willing to cross open land to get there. But they get shot and hacked to death and clubbed to death in the process. I mean, if people just didn't kill them, uh, orangutans would be all over the place. All right. Well, thank you very much. I am cognizant that it is 6.30 now, so I'm going to pass it back to uh, Rachel uh, to uh, wrap up this wonderful event. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Singleton. That was uh, super fascinating. And, and thanks to Daniel for moderating. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And, and thanks again for to uh, World Denver and um, uh, World Affairs Council for, for sponsoring this event. Thank you to everybody, too. Yeah, like I said, it's, it's really nice to be able to talk to a more diverse range of people than I've been used to for the last uh, couple of years. I, I used to do it a lot, but uh, it's nice to be able to do it again. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Take care, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Have a, have a good evening. <laughs>